Um, so uh, yeah, the welcome to the session where I'll be talking about how to build complex uh, uh, real-time analytical use cases using Flink and Apache Pinot. Uh, I guess I can just skip the intro. Uh, thanks to Fabian for introducing. Uh, so today I'll begin by discussing the use cases of real-time analytics and uh, uh, show, shed light on why this is fast becoming an important need for most of the modern businesses today. Um, I'll give an overview of Apache Pinot and uh, you know, explain why it's uh, fit for building such uh, fast real-time analytical use cases. Uh, I'll discuss the ingestion challenges that Pinot faces today, uh, which it, it's not able to overcome on its own. And next, I'll talk about Apache Flink and how uh, it, it, it can be used to overcome uh, some of these complex ingestion challenges in Pinot. And finally, uh, we'll, we can conclude with a cool demo with, with Twitch streams. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, when we talk about real-time analytics, there's actually many different subcategories of use cases, uh, and each one has its own unique requirements. We'll, we'll go through some of this in the next few slides. One of the most uh, important category is user-facing analytics, where you're exposing your analytical capabilities directly to your customers or, or end users. So for example, LinkedIn has this who, who viewed your profile dashboard, which it provides to all its 700 million plus members, where you can get a personalized view of profile views sliced across multiple dimensions, such as time, industry segment, <clears throat> excuse me, um, with geographical location, and so on. Uh, another uh, example is the LinkedIn feed relevance, um, where in order to make sure you're not seeing the same thing again and again, we want to know for a given story or content, uh, how many times has, has a user seen this in the last 14 days or so? And, and this can be done with a SQL query, something like this. Now, this may seem straightforward, but you're executing this query on, on a huge database of 700 million plus users. And every time you visit LinkedIn uh, for all active members, uh, this has to be executed, which translates to several tens of thousands of QPS on, on your underlying database. And then each such query uh, must execute very quickly uh, in the order of milliseconds. Otherwise, it's going to be a bad experience for the users. Another good example is a restaurant manager by Uber Eats. Uh, this is a dashboard given to restaurant owners across the globe where they can see different things like sales metrics on a week, week or week manner, the inaccurate orders, uh, top selling items, and so on. And, and uh, you can imagine to build something like this, you're also doing a lot of concurrent queries. And again, each such query must execute very quickly. Uh, another important category of real-time analytics is business metrics. Uh, this is where you're tracking the key indicators of your business in a, in a real-time manner. And in doing this in real-time is important uh, for day-to-day -day operation and also things like anomaly detection. So for example, uh, page views is, a, is a, an important business metric for Uber or demand and supply ratios is another one for, uh, uh, sorry, page views is an example of LinkedIn and demand and supply ratios is a business metric for Uber. Uh, and, and here you see an example where the number of page views suddenly dropped and, and you want to be able to detect this in real time. More importantly, you also want to know why that anomaly happened. Um, in other words, which dimension uh, resulted in, in the page views to drop. And detecting or uh, doing the root cause analysis in real time is also very important. And finally, we have dashboards, which everyone pretty much knows about. You know, yeah, this is one place where you can track all your application and system metrics. Uh, and as you can imagine, you know, this can also result in a lot of concurrent queries. Uh, and having a real time view of this is extremely important for for your operational needs. So all such use cases and many more uh, can be built on top of uh, Apache Pinot. For those who haven't, uh, haven't heard of this, Apache Pinot is an open source distributed data store that can ingest um, data from a wide variety of sources such as Kafka, S3, HDFS, and so on, 
and make it available for querying in real time. At the heart of Pino is, is a column store, um, and it features a, a rich set of indexes and aggregation strategies that make it a great fit for all such use cases. And it's uh, it's quite a mature product as of now. It's being used in a lot of big data companies around the globe and has a rapidly growing community as well. Uh, some of the largest Pino clusters can do upwards of million plus queries, uh, events per second ingestion, can easily do uh, hundreds of thousands of queries per second while still maintaining millisecond level latency. So this is an, uh, an overview of how Pino fits in in your overall data ecosystem. And, and we can take the example of LinkedIn. Uh, so every time people visit linkedin.com, all the events generated will be emitted to a streaming system like Kafka. And all the entity data around users and companies can be stored in something in some OLTP store. From here, data is continuously being archived uh, and into a long retention store like HDFS uh, for a variety of other use cases. Uh, as I mentioned before, Pino can actually uh, ingest data from all these sources. So within LinkedIn, uh, we, we can ingest data from Kafka and HDFS and provide a consolidated logical view to the user. So we hide the complexity uh, of, of the actual data sources. And then you can build all these uh, different use cases on top. Uh, if, if you look under the hood of Pino, let, let's look at what are the different components. So the incoming data uh, from the data source is organized in a column format and, and sprayed out across the uh, what we call as a Pino server. And, and you know you can have you can add as many Pino servers as you want, and you can configure replication amongst all these servers. There's a Pino controller, which is responsible for all the cluster coordination uh, functions, such as membership, replication, and so partitioning, and so on. And finally, we have the Pino broker, which can take a, a user query or application query, and then do a distributed scatter gather across all the servers. Uh, so what it does is it, it will identify which servers are responsible for serving this query, and, and send the query directly to those servers. All these servers will then do local processing and, and return an intermediate result to the broker. The broker will then do a final aggregation and return it back to the user. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, what makes Pino really fast uh, for the real-time analytics is, is the um, all the rich indexing strategies uh, that is available out of the box. So for example, uh, you can configure inverted, sorted, or range index for any of the numerical columns in, in your schema. Uh, JSON index lets you do fast queries on, on semi-structured or unstructured data. Uh, as the name implies, geo, geo index will accelerate your geospatial queries. And there is a special index called star tree, which is also how, why our, how our company is named, uh, which lets you pre-aggregate um, values across a range of dimensions. So this makes complex aggregation uh, queries really, really fast. And one other feature I want to call out here is the uh, something that we added recently in Pino is the ability to absurd data. Uh, so you can actually have um, real-time data coming through Kafka, which has mutations, and be able to update your Pino table uh, in, in real time. And this is something I'll actually be demoing today. OK, so now that we know a brief theory of Pino, let's see how it, uh, let's see it in action. Uh, so what I have here is a local uh, Docker instances for Pino, Kafka, and, and Zookeeper. Oh, and I forgot to mention the demo. <laughs> uh, so what in the demo, what we'll do is uh, we'll, we'll consume the Twitch stream information uh, using using its API and emit all these events into Kafka. And then subsequently, we'll ingest it in Pino and, and query the data in real time. OK, so I have this uh, nifty uh, Python script, which all it does is it queries Twitch uh, API and then emits the events to Kafka. So let's, let's start that. 
and if you uh, if you look at the kafka topics we should see a uh, something called as twitch streams uh, and just to see how um, the events look like they look something like this so we have an id which is the which uniquely identifies a twitch stream you have all the user information um, you have the game information uh, and also has an event time uh, attribute, which defines uh, the point and time at which this event was generated. Okay, so now that the events are uh, in in Kafka, we can go ahead and and start querying it in Pino. So when you deploy Pino, it comes with a convenient uh, UI uh, to do different things like manage your cluster topology and also create tables. Uh, so let, let's go ahead and create a table for our Twitch stream. Uh, first things first is to add a schema for our table. So we'll add ID as, as our dimension. We can add uh, the game name as another dimension. And, and these are both strings. Uh, we can add a viewer count, which is a metric. And then the event time which is currently in the form of a string. So we'll add it as a, as a dimension. And one last thing we'll do is add a special column called event time MS, which is actually not in, in your input Kafka stream. This will be a derived column. And, uh, and this will be designated as a time column within Pino. So the time column is currently by default how the data is partitioned in, in Pino. So that's our resulting schema. Um, let's go ahead and save that. So now we can add a real time table uh, with the same name. And, and within this, we can configure how we want to generate the derived column, which is event time MS. And this is really useful when your input stream does not have, uh, does not have the fields in the right format. So what I'm going to do here is use an, a built in function called from date time. And all it does is takes an input column, which is event time, which is in string, and convert that in, in milliseconds. So let's go ahead and do that. So what this is going to do is, for every record ingested in Pino, it's going to apply this transformation and generate a derived column called event time MS. And then we will partition data on, on the new column. Uh, we also want to specify the Kafka topic name and the Kafka URL. There are other things that you can do, which I won't go through right now, like retention, uh, quotas for your query, and so on. Um, so let's go ahead and save that. OK, so now we are ready to uh, query the, the data coming from Twitch. And keep in mind, this is real, uh, real live data, which is actually happening on Twitch right now. So if I do count star, you should see the total count increasing, as you can see below. OK. So this is cool. Uh, but let's do a slightly complicated query, which is um, we want to do a, a total count of streams um, grouped on the ID, uh, on the stream ID. And intuitively, you expect this uh, the count per ID to be one. There should be only one unique stream per ID. But as you can see, we currently have an issue here. Uh, what you see is there's multiple events happening uh, for a given ID. And let's take a deeper look why this is happening. OK. So what you can see here is for the same Twitch, uh, the stream ID, you see multiple events with, with different event time and also different viewer count. And, and what's happening is the, the Twitch stream is constantly being updated, and we are injecting these often duplicate or, or observable events in the Kafka stream. And in, in, at the moment, we haven't configured Pino to handle upserts. Um, so this is currently uh, just with Pino and the current Kafka stream, we are unable to, to handle upserts. So let me go back uh, to my presentation. Okay. 
So in order to handle upserts within Pino, uh, the prerequisite is the input Kafka stream must be partitioned on the primary key. And in this case, that's the ID column, which was not happening right now. Now, of course, you know, I could have done that in my in my Python script, but oftentimes uh, you don't control the in input Kafka streams, right? Uh, so you need a mechanism to do repartitioning of your data. Uh, even more complex scenarios is when your input stream or table does not contain all your data that you want to analyze, um, and you want to do either a stream stream join or stream table join to, to compute this materialization. Uh, and finally, you can have decoration requirement where you have events coming in uh, through your data source and you want to decorate it using an external RPC, either with something sitting in an OLTP store or, or behind an API. For all such ingestion challenges, uh, we rely on Apache Flink. Um, for again, and hopefully you all know Apache Flink already. It's an extremely popular uh, stream processing framework which lets you perform computational tasks on bounded and unbounded streams of data. Uh, it, it comes with a wide uh, variety of input and output connectors and features a rich API, and also includes things like state management, uh, which makes it a great fit for <clears throat> building different applications, such as event-driven applications, uh, streaming ETL, and analytics, and so on. Uh, of course, Flink is a quite a mature product, and it's used uh, in a lot of uh, companies around the globe, uh, especially uh, what I want to focus is the Alibaba's numbers from 2019. Uh, this is quite a while ago. Uh, the decent numbers are probably much higher. But it was able to do 2.5 billion events per second at peak, which is really, really impressive. Uh, for this particular talk, I want to focus on one important aspect of Flink, which is the Flink SQL. Uh, and as the name implies, it lets you express your computational logic using a declarative way, something, something like this. Um, this is based on the Apache CalCite grammar, which is very similar to ANSI SQL, but also adds some advanced things like window semantics, um, which is required for continuous queries. And as you can see here, uh, Flink SQL is actually built on top of the existing uh, primitives. And in fact, a given a Flink SQL query would be translated into the underlying API and, and executed as a as regular Flink job. Uh, and again, you, know, uh, you can execute it on both uh, on unbounded and bounded streams. So when you're running it against something like Kafka, it runs as a continuous query. Uh, so it keeps generating output continuously, uh, as opposed to something like a, a standard S3 or HDFS file, it, it will be executed as a traditional SQL query. So this is just a very high level overview of Flink. I, I highly recommend the talk from Marta Pace and, and other people from Vervetica for, for Flink and Flink SQL. Excuse me. OK. So <clears throat> what we'll do now is to I'll show how we can solve some of the ingestion challenges we saw in Pino using Flink. So we'll go back to our Twitch API, and we'll uh, continue generating the, the real uh, the Twitch stream uh, information into Kafka. But we'll, what we are also doing here is to prefetch the tags information and store it as, as a JSON file in, in S3. Uh, at this point, we'll be using Flink to do a join between this Kafka topic and, and this and this S3 file, sort of like a stream table join, and, and emit the information uh, back to Kafka. The other thing the Flink job will be doing is repartitioning this, this data on the primary key that we need for PNOM suits. <clears throat> so it'll be partitioning on the ID column. And finally, I'll show how this can be ingested into Pino, and we'll do a cool visualization using Superset. So let me switch back to my demo environment. So first thing I'll do is, is start a uh, Flink SQL client uh, tool, which is a very convenient way of submitting your Flink queries um, and, and starting the actual Flink job. Okay. So first thing we want to do is create a table to read from the Kafka topic for uh, which has the real-time Twitch stream information. 
let's go ahead and do that. So it contains all the dimensions from the Twitstream API and also defines where the data is coming from, which is our Kafka, local Kafka cluster. Next, we'll create a table to consume data from the, um, the JSON file stored in S3. Let's do that. Um, it has only two dimensions, the tag ID and description. And uh, as you can imagine, we'll be joining on the tag ID uh, column. And again, here we are showing, okay, the connector is file system and it'll be reading uh, from, from S3. And finally, we'll create a table, which is a result of the join operation of, of these two things. So it has the dimensions from both the Kafka and, and tags uh, file, and we, we want to emit it back to Kafka. Hence, we're using the Kafka connector. The other thing, if you notice here, we are defining, we're specifying the key field as ID. Uh, so we, what we want to do is partition the data on the ID column. In other words, all records with the same uh, Twitch stream ID will end up in the same Kafka partition and will enable Pino to do upsorts. OK, so now we're ready to actually execute our, our join query, which looks something like this. Uh, and, and again, you know, it, it looks pretty identical to an, a regular ANSI SQL query. Um, we select, we project all the dimensions from, from the two tables and then define the join criteria, which is the tag ID. And I'm doing a simple inner join here, but Flink has a lot of advanced ways of, of doing defining windows for your join function. OK, so at this point, the join uh, was executed. We have a job running, which is continuously joining data from Kafka and S3 and, and emitting events to Kafka. So if I uh, look at my Kafka topics, I should see a new topic pop up here, which is Twitch streams with tags. And this is the topic which includes the join as well as the repartitioning, thanks to Flink. At this point, uh, what I can do is uh, to save time, I've already created a Pinot schema, which has mm -hmm. all the dimensions we want. And I'm also specifying a primary key here, uh, which is the ID column. Similarly, I also have an absurd table, uh, which looks similar to the table that we created before. Let's go and add this uh, to Pino using uh, the convenient REST API. Okay. So now we are ready to query our absurd table. So as you can see, it has the all the dimensions as a result of the join uh, from from Kafka and S3, uh, we can re-execute our our group by query and and see what the result looks like now. As I mentioned before, um, this the new Pino table we we have partitioned the data on ID column and enabled upsorts within Pino. So now the result of the group by, uh, oh sorry, I'm still using the old table. Pardon me. As you can see now, uh, the group by uh, is uh, indeed one. And Pino is actually successfully uh, either doing deduplicating data or handling upsets correctly from the input stream. Uh, so in this manner, you know, we, we, we saw how you know, Flink can easily do join and repartitioning in a matter of minutes. And, and this was all uh, real data from Twitch, just to re-emphasize. Uh, at this point, what we can do is uh, use superset to visualize uh, the information. So let's go and uh, add the new table that we created in Pino, which is the, the stream subsert. Uh, one thing, uh, if you haven't used superset before, I need to let superset know which is your time column. And in our case, that's event time milliseconds. That's our temporal column. And we also want to tell superset the format, which is epochs in millisecond. OK, so now uh, we're, we can start visualizing this data coming from Twitch. So I'll pick a line chart, bucket it by every second. And let's say we want to see everything from now to minus seven days. OK, 
So you can see the current demo that, that we ran and something I was testing in the morning. <laughs> uh, and, and the queries are returning obviously very fast because what Superset is doing is sending it to Pino and, and querying the Twitch stream data in real time. We can also do a little bit more complex things like figure out what are the most popular streams happening right now. Uh, so let's do a group by on, on the game name. Uh, and I, all, you can again see this is really fast because of, of Pino and Flink. And then this is the current um, popular streams happening on Twitch as of now. So overall, uh, what we saw, let me switch back. Um, just to reiterate what we just saw, we we we, ha we had uh, real stream information being emitted into Kafka and then tags information going to S3. We did a, a join using Flink SQL, uh, repartition the data also using the same Flink SQL query, uh, ingested into Pino, and Pino was able to do handle the upsets correctly. And at this point, and, and you can use anything, something like Superset to visualize all your data. Um, so I, I can conclude, stop here, and then take any questions. But uh, overall, Flink SQL is a really powerful construct which lets you do uh, complex things in a in a very very fast manner, as you saw right now, and is being used at a massive scale in Alibaba and, and other companies. Um, Apache Pin is also uh, we saw the distributed and scale out design uh, and and the rich indexing support that it features. And it also being used in a lot of companies around the world. Uh, be before I stop, I would do want to acknowledge uh, Martha Pace, who's who's taking a bow here as, as she should. Um, so she she helped me a lot with the initial demo and answering the fling questions uh, that I had. So thank you, Martha. Uh, at this point, I I, I can I'll stop here and, and take any questions that you guys have. Thanks a lot. I guess we're waiting for Fabian to be on the stage. Uh, while while that is um, while Fabian is is coming back, um, since I'm unable to see see the the questions, I can talk a little bit more on uh, you know the the Pino architecture um, and and the, I mentioned the scale out design, um, so, so we I'll quickly talk a little bit more on that while we wait. Um, so. As I, as I mentioned, uh, you know the data is laid out in a column format uh, across across all these servers. Uh, so th this forms this makes it very easy to expand capacity uh, on on the Pino side. Anytime you are uh, facing a bottleneck, we can just add more servers. The controller will automatically um, uh, get the uh, the new identify the new servers and start. Putting segments, uh, Pino segments, on onto these new servers. Similarly, you can add brokers uh, at any point, uh, and 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 this is how we can keep scaling out the Pino cluster uh, at will. Okay, I'll, I, I can again stop here and take any questions uh, if there are any. Yeah, thanks for this awesome talk, uh, Chinmay. Sorry for the uh, for the technical problems. No problem. Um, yeah, that was really uh, really awesome awesome demo. I have a question though. Sure. Um, have you have you thought about uh, or do you think it would make sense to um, integrate uh, Flink with uh, Pino a little bit tighter? Yeah. Um, similar as you uh, as you did with the um, like um, leveraging uh, Presto for the uh, for for the joint capability, would that be an option to like somehow um, fuse the systems together? Yeah, great question. Yeah, so this this is a common ask uh, from from many folks where you want to basically skip uh, an intermediate stage between Flink and Pino, right? Currently, uh, as in the demo, also I mentioned we have to emit the events to Kafka and then ingest into Pino. So uh, currently, there is one way. Um, that that we are uh, working on right now, uh, which is a segment writer uh, API that is available uh, for for Flink jobs to directly use uh, and, and 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 produce to Pino. Uh, the downside is uh, so so the let, let me maybe step back into how Pino uh, actually ingests the data. Um, 
So when, when we are fetching data from real time, uh, the records are ingested uh, one at a time. Uh, and, and, and they are being converted into a column format for the corresponding segments. Um, uh, but when you, in, in the offline world, uh, we create the segments outside of Pino and then copy it in, into Pino. So is it, that's essentially what we do with the current uh, integration between Flink and Pino, which is use the segment writer API to generate a local segment and then push the local segment to Pino. Um, so the trade-off here is, you know, the the freshness of your data uh, depends on how big your segment is. Right? So if you keep producing, so you can keep appending to your local segment within your Flink job, uh, and let's say you do that for ten minutes, uh, so 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 the data will be available for querying ten minutes later. So so it's more like a micro batch uh, mode today. Uh, so, so that that's the current mechanism, right? So you you can yeah. indeed create segments within within Flink and push to Pino, and, and actually Uber is uh, playing around with that um, as we speak. Uh, the other one that we want to get to is a write API in in Pino. So be able to write one record at a time um, in, in directly into Pino, and this is something that that we're still working on. And once that's available, then Flink can directly start writing into Pino and, and make it available in, in real time. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. Um, so in the meantime, we also uh, got a few questions from the audience. Okay. Um, the first one is, uh, how is Apache Pino different from Google BigQuery or AWS Athena? Got it. Um, I don't really have any slide for that, but I can talk about it. Um, so when you compare uh, so Pino, um, the the emphasis or the Pino is really optimized for um, accelerating the real time uh, analytics, right? So the the focus is on reducing the ingestion latency of the data coming in. Uh, so to so basically make the uh, data available to query within milliseconds from when it is generated from the source, uh, and also the query latency is also uh, the focus is to uh, keep it on the millisecond range. Uh, and, and if you look at BigQuery, the, it's optimized for a different set of problems, right? It's optimized more for more complex uh, SQL, SQL queries where the ingestion latency is may, may or may not be that important. It's okay to have the data coming in minutes later uh, or hours later. And uh, the focus is on executing more warehouse style uh, complex SQL queries. Uh, and again, you know the throughput and latency that that BigQuery can do, uh, you know, to do something like hundred thousand QPS can get prohibitively expensive on BigQuery, whereas Pino is designed for handling, you know, massive QPS on uh, for OLAP cubes, uh, cube style queries. Um, with uh, Amazon Athena, I think that's more of um, it's it's more like, uh, I guess you can compare that to Flink, <laughs> uh, more so than than Pino here. Um, it's it's uh, Pino is a data store, so you, you can put your data in and query it whenever you want. So you can have seven months, you know, one one year. In, in, within Uber, we have something that has uh, one uh, almost two years worth of data in Pino in some use cases that you can query. Um, and it, it's it's a traditional data store, right? Uh, so it's a pull semantics, whereas Amazon Athena is more on the push semantics side. Yeah, thanks for the. Yeah, so there's one more question. Um, yeah. So how rich are the um, querying capabilities compared to uh, regular SQL? Yeah, yeah, great question. So uh, we uh, so Pino again is optimized for OLAP queries. So it, it can speed up, you know, aggregation functions, group by and order by and all that. Um, but what we don't do effectively is uh, NVA joins, for example. Right? We, we, the focus is not to support complex joints within Pino. Um, so for that, we, uh, as, as Fabian already mentioned, we integrated closely with Presto to do uh, all those complex things uh, in, in the Presto layer. And Pino can handle the filtering, aggregation, uh, some of the basic window functions. Uh, so so that, that, would be, that would be one. Like joints is one example, which is not supported today. Uh, we do have lookup joints within Pino. 
Um, so what what we what we do is let's say you have a small dimension table, and you want to decorate your larger fact tables in Pinot with this small dimension table. That is supported today. Um, so you can have do a lookup join locally within each Pinot server. Uh, so, so but having you know large fact fact join, I think that that's not supported today. Okay, thank you. Um, one more, or there's even two more questions. Um, one is the last one. Um, partitioning on the upset key seems mm -hmm. like a strong constraint. What's the mm -hmm. advantage compared to writing every event and then using an analytical function on it, like um, um, an over partition by order by uh, partition yeah. by key order by event time and then last function on that? Right. Yeah, so it really comes down to um, query latency. Right. Uh, what what we want uh, to do is minimize the work that can that needs to happen at query time. Um, as I mentioned, Pino is used for a lot of like user facing analytics, um, and and it's embedded in the core business flow within LinkedIn and Uber. So any you know any query latency delays will actually affect the overall site latency for LinkedIn and Uber. Uh, so it's, it's it's imperative that the latency SLA is within you know, 100 milliseconds. So, so from that frame of thought, we wanted to minimize what we do at query time. So we came up with this model where we assume that the data is partitioned on the primary key beforehand. Um, and then within a server, we use a simple bitmap uh, to keep track of like, we, we are co-locating all the upsertable events together, which enables Pino to do uh, handle upserts. Um, you know, the on the question of, you know, Pre-partitioning is expensive. Uh, yes, yeah, it, there is an additional cost to it, but oftentimes you can. It's it's a matter of selecting a key within your Kafka producer, and that's all. If you if you looked at my demo, all I did was select a key for my Kafka producer, and and that was it. Uh, and this can be done with your existing applications, or even if you're, you know, ingesting change log from Debezium, you can select a key there, and so on. So uh, how is Pinot different from uh, Apache Druid? Yeah, yeah, great question. The, this is Pinot and Druid uh, architecturally very similar. They both um, you know, ingest data in the same way. Uh, they both column store. The differences I mentioned in my previous slide, uh, I, I can just read it out since we don't have much time. Uh, the, one of the main differences is the, the different set of indexes that, that, that we already have and we keep adding. Uh, Pino's pluggable architecture makes it very easy to add new indexes uh, and, uh, in a very easy manner. So currently, you know, range index, JSON index, geospatial index, star tree index, this is not available in Druid. And this is what makes Pino really fast. Text search is not available in Druid. Um, uh, that, that the Lucene index that, that, that we've added in Pino, being able to upsert data, uh, that's actually an architectural difference that, that's there in Pino and, and not in Druid. 